Decided. The adoption of this protocol by unanimity. I wish it were a little stronger on developing nations' participation. The developing countries like China, India and Brazil weren't required to meet the same cut. Already says the Senate will not approve it. Let's make sure that what we do doesn't unduly harm American citizens. We will not submit this agreement for ratification until key developing nations participate in this effort. I, George Walker Bush, do solemnly swear. I will not commit our nation to an unsound treaty that will throw millions of our citizens out of work. So help you God. So help me God. Congratulations, Mr. President. <laughs> Few challenges facing America and the world are more urgent than combating climate change. Denial is no longer an acceptable response. Copenhagen summit was intended to pick up where Kyoto left off. We doubt that we can get to the legally binding agreement that everybody wants. He also says developing countries such as China, Brazil and India also have to bear the burden for climate change. Leaders agreed that finding a successor to Kyoto at Copenhagen would be highly unlikely. It was a gloomy Arctic morning. After a long flight, Obama met with his team to get the current mood. Several countries had expressed interest in his interim agreement. However, Europeans were holding out for a fully binding treaty, while emerging nations, most notably China, favored maintaining the status quo. After meeting with the Danish Prime Minister, Obama took the stage in a makeshift auditorium to present the key components of his agreement, as well as the alternative. We can choose delay, falling back into the same divisions that have stood in the way of action for years. Following that, he and his team engaged in a series of sideline group meetings with other players, moving from one session to the next through crowed corridor of people trying to get a glimpse at the action. Yet, a pivotal moment of the day still lay ahead. The one-on-one -on -one meeting with Chinese Prime Minister Wen. With an extensive delegation in tow, Prime Minister Wen had so far been resistant to changes in previous meetings. When the two finally met, Obama pushed back, warning that avoiding any obligations toward transparency would prove to be a long-term disaster for the planet. The meeting felt short of expectations, and they simply agreed to meet later. By late afternoon, the US had managed to get a draft agreement endorsed by EU members and several other delegates, but got nowhere with China. Provocative enough, Wen skipped follow-up sessions and sent inflexible representatives instead, including his Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs. I think China still has desired to summon agreement, as we are. As the day wore on, Obama was led into a room filled with unhappy Europeans, all of them bombarding him with relentless questions. For what felt like an endless hour, they wearily expressed their concerns and frustrations. That is, until the reality of the situation settled over the room. I think what Barack describes is not the option we had hoped for, but it may be our only option today. So, we wait to see what the Chinese and the others say, and then we decide. You'll go meet them now? Yep. Good luck, then. Back in their holding room, 
Marvin, Obama's close aide, informed the delegation that they had to leave soon to avoid a ferocious snowstorm approaching the East Coast. New York, Northern Pennsylvania, and New England could see up to three feet by tomorrow. Obama decided he needed to meet with Wen right away. Well, that was until something unexpected happened. It turned out staffers had been informed that the Chinese delegation was already on its way back to the airport. 45,000 attendees and the one and only person Obama needs to meet has vanished. However, there were rumors that he was still in the building with other regulation-resistant leaders, but no one could confirm it. So you're saying he's ducking me? We got folks out looking. A few minutes later, a shocked Marvin arrived. Wen had been spotted in a conference room upstairs with India, South Africa, and Brazil. All right, then. Turning to Hillary, he asked, When was the last time you crashed a party? She started laughing. Obama then addressed his team. We had a meeting scheduled. They're here. Let's go. The entire group immediately stood up. Obama confidently led the very large crowd upstairs with them shouting, let the president pass. Just behind him was Hillary, followed by many staffers while Secret Service agents brought up the rear. The US delegation moved forward like an unstoppable herd. For those watching, I'm always hopeful. It felt like Moyes opening the Red Sea. An agent in charge of protocol security tried to stop them, but was pushed back by some of the staffers. Approaching the conference room, the Chinese security tried to intercept them, hands held up as if ordering them to stop. But when they realized who they were, well, they had no other choice but to nod and let Obama and Hillary pass. All right, my guys get in just like your guys got in. This is a joint meeting. My guys get in, or we're leaving the meeting. Before anyone could object, they both grabbed a chair. Obama explained how Europeans were prepared to accept the interim agreement if all countries agreed to have their emissions independently verified. As one might expect, the four leaders took turns explaining how the Kyoto Protocol was working just fine and how the suggested verification mechanism would violate their national sovereignty. After a half hour of getting nowhere, Obama had had enough. So let me cut to the chase. Before I walked into this room, I assumed the plan was for all of you to leave here and announce that the U.S. was responsible for the failure to reach a new agreement. Of course, I may be wrong, but if I leave this room without an agreement, I'm going to tell the press that I was prepared to commit to a big reduction in our greenhouse gases and billions of dollars in new assistance, and that each of you decided it was better to do nothing. I'm going to say the same thing to all the poor countries that stood to benefit from that new money, and we'll see who they believe. Once the translator had finished, the Chinese staffers started yelling, their faces turning red from the heated back and forth. Eventually, Wen raised a firm hand and everyone immediately sat back. What did they say? The Chinese translator looked at Wen. He shook his head and whispered something. Premier Wen says that it's not important what the other ministers said. Premier Wen asks if you have the agreement you're proposing with you, so everyone can look at the specific language again. With a couple of changes, a final version of the agreement was signed by all parties. After a day of disarray and disagreement, five countries, including the U.S., did finally approve a plan to verify efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It was an extraordinary end to a frustrating day that capped two years of negotiations, finally stalling over one country, China, and its initial refusal to accept international monitoring over its emission cuts. For the first time in history, all major economies have come together to accept their responsibility to take action to confront the threat of climate change. The president called the plan reached with China, India and others to list the actions they will take to curb global warming a meaningful breakthrough. But he also said there are fundamental deadlocks and perspectives between rich nations and poor. They are not all happy. 
Even with China and India on board, the Copenhagen Accord still carries little actual power, with the prospect of a legally binding deal to limit climate change as far away as ever. If we just waited for that, then we would not make any progress. They didn't get what they really came here for, a legally binding treaty among all countries to make concrete cuts to gas emissions and curb global warming. Tonight, President Obama acknowledged there is much more work to do. This is going to be hard. Now, this is hard within countries. Uh, it's going to be even harder between countries. The Copenhagen Accord acknowledges the need to limit the world temperature rise to two degrees. It sets some long-term targets for cutting emissions and says rich countries will meet the financial needs of the poor. We've come a long way, but we have much further to go. Am I frustrated that we're not taking bolder steps that, uh, you know, if you examine the science, are required? Absolutely. Am I pessimistic that we will get this done? No. What looked like a disaster in Copenhagen planted the seed for subsequent success. We have been able to forge for the first time an international agreement about climate change. Our planet is minutes to midnight for the 1.5 degree limit. Working apart, we are a force powerful enough to destabilize our planet. Surely, working together, we are powerful enough to save it. If we pledge to do our part and then follow through on those commitments, I believe we can secure a better future. We have to. And what a profound and noble task to set for ourselves.